Hello, everybody, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Welcome to this, uh, the first of a new series of webinars and reports that are going to be brought to you through Lloyd's Register, uh, developing a series of in-depth reports looking at the latest development in alternative maritime fuels, including methanol, but we'll also be focusing on biofuels, hydrogen, ammonia, and other fuels, and examining the whole transformation of the of the industry and we're going to be doing that with expert analysis such as we have on the panel today and uh, to give a comprehensive and informative overviews of what's going on in the industry my name is uh, craig eason i'm going to be your moderator and host for this hour before uh, we get into the panelists let me go through some of the house rules that we're going to deploy for today all of you will find that your microphones are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar um, but you will be able to ask questions you could use the questions tab you'll find a questions or a q a uh, tab within your console within go to webinar please use that to ask your questions i should be able to see all of them and then i'll be passing them on to the three panelists that we've got with us today you will be able to also if you have any problems connecting you will see that there is a telephone connection you can click on that if you have any problems and that'll give you a telephone number to be able to dial so that you can connect to the webinar using the telephone. And uh, just, just finally, the recording will be made available after the webinar and we'll be doing a survey um, after the webinar as well. Subsequent to this, of course, there'll be the Fuel for Thought methanol um, report, which you'll be able to download as well through Lloyd's Register. But with, with that to do, let me introduce you to the panelists that we've got for you today. Um, we have here um, myself, of course, uh, from Fathom World. I'm a maritime broadcaster and a journalist. I've been in the industry since about 1985 in various roles. Douglas Wright, he's regional advisor um, for Lloyd's Register. You will notice when you uh, logged on or when you were registering that we were hoping to have Chris Chatterton from the Methanol Institute. Unfortunately, he's not available. Douglas has uh, offered to step in at the last minute. He's got a lot of expertise around uh, methanol as a fuel and we'll be talking to him a lot about some of the elements relating to the supply and production but also he'll be able to answer your questions relating to issues such as methanol quality determining where and how we're going to get the methanol then we got Sobit Hathri Haran he's a global new build support manager from Lloyd's Register he's going to be talking to us about the technical issues and regulatory issues relating to methanol as a fuel as we see it evolving and this will include new buildings and retrofits and finally Tom Strang he's senior vice president maritime affairs at Carnival he's been a Carnival since 2000 and has been involved in a number of panels a number of committees and he's also a very um, he's a member of SGMF and uh, CLNG so he's in good position to talk to me about some of the issues relating to a shift in fuel from uh, from Carnival or um, a cruise operator's perspective. He'll not be giving a presentation, but he and I will be having a, more of a chat, I'll say, after the first two presentations. So with that in mind, Douglas, could I hand over to you, please, uh, to give the first presentation? Uh, thank you very much, Craig, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, welcome, everybody, to the uh, webinar. I personally, from a... Um, experience perspective like the title of this uh, webinar very much is it um, methanol's time to shine in the maritime industry as one of the alternative fuels to be explored and i would say it couldn't be um, more overdue actually i remember in 2015 when lng seemed to have all the the press um, rooting for its um, you know, single candidacy almost as an environmental fuel of the future. And I was wondering as a chemical engineer, hmm, methanol, liquid, fairly easy to handle, biodegradable, miscible in water. What is there not to like? So it's taken a few years and finally methanol is getting to a position where it is being taken as a serious contender and a serious alternative to be explored for the shipping industry. Uh, next slide, please. And to emphasize the point, um, I would like to um, kind of start first before talking about a supply and production. Actually, what is driving the demand? Then 
If you look at the maritime sector, we currently have 29 ships in operation, all methanol fueled, and about 112 on order. And these are not discriminated amongst single shipping types. They're a combination of container ships, bulk carriers, chemical carriers, and um, ferries. So the numbers are on the rise. And we're even now seeing, as Lloyd's Register, with a number of clients that we talk to, that there's a fair amount of conversion projects considered as well. The, the middle graph is a projection from Clarkson that estimates that by 2030, 1,200 ships will be methanol fueled. And that's a great um, increase and, and a great development for methanol as a fuel into the maritime industry. Having said that, of course, uh, there is no single bullet fuel really that we can hang our hat on as the industry. So the, the right chart really depicts the multi-fuel future that we will uh, see unfold over the many years and play out. And methanol will be just one of the fuels that the industry will consider in its ambition to decarbonize. Uh, next slide, please. So let us then look at the feedstocks and markets. Uh, as many of you may well know, there's a different production routes to the production of methanol, predominantly brown, gray, blue, and green, where brown is pretty much coal as a feedstock to, um, to produce methanol, then natural gas, uh, gray methanol, and then carbon capture, um, uh, pairing it up with, um, with, with hydrogen to produce uh, blue methanol, and then finally green methanol, which is uh, either through electrification or through, um, through biogenetic uh, sources. I think to, to put that in perspective then, if we start from brown to gray to, to green, brown, gray are the more uh, carbon intense methanol uh, sources of production all the way to blue, green, where it's increasingly getting more uh, carbon uh, neutral. So this is kind of a, an important point to make because that plays into the trajectory of methanol being adopted by shipping, where perhaps ships could start with grey methanol and transition uh, slowly over time at blue and green methanol as these uh, forms of methanol will become increasingly more available and, and cost effective. Uh, to give you kind of a high level number, 55% of all methanol produced in the world goes into the chemical industry and 45% goes into the fuels industry, which is currently predominantly for land-based applications. But as we've seen, also the shipping markets are more and more placing a demand for methanol as a fuel to uh, reach its uh, decarbonization ambition. Globally, and uh, next slide, please. Globally, there is about 100 million tons of methanol being produced. Uh, and in this chart, you can see that predominantly over 50% will go into the chemical sector and about 45% goes into the fuel sector. Now, 98 million tons may not sound like a lot, but what is very unique about the methanol industry is that supply and demand are very balanced. So in the last 20 years, we've never seen demand truly outstripping supply and supply outstripping demand. So it's a very reliable sector in this regard. It also has the unique ability to scale up should it be needed. So for example, if the maritime sector would put additional demand for methanol, the industry should be able to flex and increase global methanol production to get more of the product available for the shipping community to, uh, to enjoy. And, and the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because the market is so well balanced, it creates a lot of uh, better price um, reliability, for lack of a better word. So less price volatility, predictable supply, and consistent quality are the benefits of a well-balanced market. So that's a, that's a positive uh, thing for the industry. Next slide, please. 
So when we look at availability now globally for shipping, and I think for a lot of people on this uh, webinar, the question would be, okay, I'm interested to build a methanol fuel ship or convert an existing asset to use methanol, but is the fuel available? And, and on, this, it does, on this world map, we've placed basically all the ports that have a capacity between 25 to 50,000 tons of methanol currently available as realistic ports where methanol conceivably could be bought and bunkered for ships and ship operators choosing methanol as a fuel. And what, what I find interesting if I look at this chart, okay, we've, we've looked at ports where there is storage capacity uh, which is fairly significant between 25 to 50,000 tons and can conceivably also increase over time. The actual take up of the bunker industry to explore infrastructure in those ports seems a little bit hesitant at this stage. We do see uh, sporadic uh, news items in the media about methanol bunkering barges being built and 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 uh, potentially used by bunker suppliers but i would say for the shipping community to really truly reap the benefits of ample and stable methanol supply there will be a need for the existing bunkering infrastructure to accelerate potentially the ability to source store and deliver these fuels to ships and with over 100 ports in the world, I would suggest time is now to plan those activities because in 2024, already quite a few of the big ships uh, operating on metal as a fuel will be a reality and all of those will need reliable and sustainable supply of methanol to, uh, to reap the benefits of methanol as a fuel to decarbonize the sector. And with that, I thank you, and I hand it over back to Craig. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug, and uh, some very good points there, which I'm sure will, will uh, pop up. Just a reminder to everybody that uh, you can put your Q&As, your questions into the uh, Q panel. The answers hopefully will come after. We'll not be taking Q Q&As now, but um, at the end, uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes or so, but put your questions in. If you can also note who you'd like me to ask the question to, it'd be a great help. Uh, but with that in mind, I'd like to hand over now to Sobit for his uh, presentation. Sobit, the uh, the camera is yours. Thanks, Craig. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much again for joining uh, this particular session. Um, my name is Shobed and thanks Craig for the introduction. And in my role, I work with uh, ship owners, charters, um, shipyards, and also equipment makers uh, with a focus on alternative fuels. And when we have discussions with mostly on the new building projects, there is a lot of interest in terms of alternative fuels and we're getting a lot of inquiries and questions. And when we look at some of those factors, um, some of those questions or topics that are coming up, we thought it's really very good to collate some of our answers, some of our experiences or industry experts' experiences on that, and then circulate that by me. So that's actually one of the reasons why we have actually come up with this particular uh, fuel for thought series. And in this particular session, I'll briefly highlight some of the contents that we actually have within that particular report. And uh, that will briefly include some of the current drivers for GHG reduction, um, and in terms of specifically in terms of methanol, where do we stand uh, with regards to the regulatory framework? And in terms of the uh, technology readiness, for instance, the engines or equipment that are strictly required to be installed on board, um, where do we uh, see the progress? And we will then mention some of the considerations for a new building project, uh, for instance, to use methanol as a fuel, and perhaps then wrap up with some of those considerations for ships uh, that perhaps running now on conventional fuel um, to be using uh, methanol as a fuel after a retrofit. Um, so briefly, we know in terms of the IMO's greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy from 2018, we have actually seen the strategy come into force and um, expecting a 50 percentage reduction in the overall GHG emissions in 2050 by 2050. 
And they have actually followed up that with a number of regulatory drivers, for instance, in technical as technical design of the ships. We have various phases of EEDI and the newly introduced EEXI. And in terms of the operational efficiency improvement, there is also the carbon intensity indicator coming up, that which has been formed. Um, and there is also the uh, fuel life cycle emission standards that's currently in the works. And outside of IMO, we also see market-based measures being proposed by I by EU introducing ships, uh, shippings to EU ETS and also the fuel EU maritime. And we might also see the, the revision of the IMO's greenhouse gas reduction strategy uh, coming up perhaps in July this year with the MEPC. And we're expecting the standard or the, the curve in terms of the reduction to be much more stringent. So essentially all of this is really driving uh, the adoption of methanol and also some of the other alternative fuels um, going forward. So in terms of the regulatory framework for methanol, um, so it is well known in terms of its application um, and there is considerable experience within the industry transport, in transporting methanol as a cargo. So uh, on methanol carriers or chemical tankers, uh, we've been carrying that and regulations from Marple and X2 and also the IBC code uh, are enforced. And in, 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 in terms of containerized carriage on board vessels, there is also the requirements from the IMDG code, which are all very clear. Um, so in terms of applying it as a fuel, so we have the IGF code from which we can take the safety philosophy and also follow the goal-based uh, sort of approach. And IMO has also released the interim guidelines 1621, which clearly provides a number of uh, regulatory requirements in terms of its application on board ships. Uh, LR has had our rules from 2015 onwards, and we have been continuously revising those with uh, the number of projects that we've been undertaking. And we have now completely incorporated the uh, interim guidelines into our rules and along with some of our own uh, specific requirements. And there is also the gas ready notation along with other class notations to signify the, uh, the use of methanol on board the vessel. Um, and also there are a number of other quality standards now being developed, for instance, uh, IMPCA, they've had the methanol uh, reference specifications. Uh, there are also the ISO standard uh, currently being developed in terms of the application of uh, methanol as a marine fuel. So um, let's take a brief look at some of the technological aspects related to the methanol. So, if we are looking at having a methanol fueled vessel, what maybe are some of the considerations or technologies or systems that we have to put on board? So essentially this uh, is a very high level drawing just to show, yes, we need to have provision for storage. Uh, so there'll be methanol fuel storage tanks, and then there'll be bunk provisions for bunkering. So a bunkering manifold, and then uh, fuel process equipment. So of course, to, there could be a high pressure pump or a heat exchanger unit along with filtering units and associated safety systems, all of which incorporated within a small methanol fuel processing compartment or a room. And there'll be double wall lines then bringing the pressurized condition fuel to the consumers, it could be the main engines, the auxiliary engines and methanol being a uh, liquid fuel um, so we, we also need to have provisions for continuous recirculation and also some form of uh, draining so um, in terms of all these uh, fuel systems uh, or fuel processing systems a number of different vendors and equipment makers have developed their own systems in uh, in accordance with the specifications from various uh, engine makers so these are uh, the well known uh, in terms of safety studies and analysis. A lot of those has been carried out and uh, many installed on board. So if we then look into, let's say the technology readiness for the engines, uh, the MAN LGIM engines has been in, for, in use from 2016 onwards. And there are also a number of other different engine options being released for different ship types. Um, and in terms of WinGD, the engine development is in progress and expected to have the first engine delivered uh, sometime in 2024, 2025. And in terms of uh, auxiliary engines uh, of uh, the Fordzilla W32 series, uh, Hyundai Hims, and just to give us some examples, and also a number of other engine makers, including MAN, are developing these uh, four-stroke engines suitable for uh, auxiliary propulsion needs on board. Uh, in addition, there are also developments ongoing uh, for using uh, methanol as a fuel for uh, fuel cells, mostly in terms of 
reforming it to hydrogen, and then you had using hydrogen as a fuel in the uh, fuel cells. So as we can see, the the technology more or less is actually very well established uh, for its application. And um, when we look into some of these uh, new building considerations, so we saw that in order to have methanol as a fuel, we need to have a number of different systems on board, even storage of this uh, fuel processing and supply systems. So all of this is actually going to uh, generate a number of different hazards or risk on board the vessel, which, uh, with which the onboard um, design or uh, the staff are not really familiar with. So, of course, we need to eliminate or minimize these particular risks. And one of the approach that we follow within LR is to actually undertake the risk-based certification process. And the, the small floor diagram uh, flow chart is actually just giving that bit of an illustration. So we undertake very detailed sort of uh, design and safety assessment uh, to identify essentially what maybe are the additional systems that are being put on board and how does it actually uh, deviate some, from some of the prescriptive requirements that we have. It will then go through a detailed hazard and hazard workshops with a number of different stakeholders, including engine makers, shipyards, uh, ship operators, and also owners, really to iron out what perhaps would be the uh, hazards due to these systems and what are being provided in the vessel's technical design itself to eliminate or minimize these particular risks. So we have freely prepared a number of detailed uh, documents giving the introduction to the process and also a number of different templates uh, giving uh, exactly some helpful information for ship owners, uh, yeah, on yards and operators. And here is just a simple illustration to give uh, an idea in terms of what perhaps could um, under be undertaken during, let's say, a hazard workshop. So essentially, we will look at one specific aspect of the uh, design. So here, if you're looking at the storage, provision for storage and also the provision for bunkering, um, then in terms of the hazards, we are looking at um, perhaps possible methanol leakage and associated toxicity risk to people who are persons who are involved with the bunkering operation. There could be fire considerations. And in terms of if there is a leakage, um, the look, if, and if it's a location of the bunkering station is quite close to the accommodation area or where people are, then they could be, sub they could be subjected to these risks. And once these assets are known, then we could identify whether there are sufficient preventive or mitigative measures in place. For instance, could there be showers or eye wash, and liquid PPE, has this been provided? Or can there be a provision for the remote monitoring of the bunkering operation itself, um, which could eliminate the need for personnel to be at that particular location in the first instance? Um, uh, is there a liquid firefighting provision suitable for methanol firefighting provided at that particular location? So essentially, uh, foolproofing the design uh, to eliminate or uh, minimize all those assets. So, um, in terms of uh, new building considerations, we also have ship owners who are looking at um, conventionally fueled vessels at this point. Of course, there is a lot of uncertainty in terms of what could be the fuel of choice in the future. Um, so we are working together closely to provide guest ready descriptive notes. So for instance, to this, this essentially illustrates um, conventionally fueled ships or, or natively fueled ships, to what level or to what extent these are ready for another alternative fuel. For instance, for methanol's case, we have a descriptive note that illustrates uh, with an ML notation, uh, which gives some uh, assurance in terms of uh, the vessel's readiness uh, towards using, let's say, methanol in future. And uh, then there are this is just an illustration of the case uh, for a bulk carrier. So it, it's looking at a uh, Kamsa Max vessel. And uh, of course, one of the main constraints there was in terms of uh, um, locating the fuel tank itself. So with a capacity of around 2,400 cubic, um, the tank, it could be located perhaps within the mid midship section area, or can it be located forward of the uh, um, engine room or or after the accommodation area itself. So essentially the main consideration there itself is uh, to minimize any cargo space loss uh, when we add this particular uh, tank. 
So if we then look into some of the conversion considerations, so of course, if it is a vessel uh, using conventional fuel now, uh, one of the first things to look at is also the fuel storage or the provision for a storage tank. And when we look at, let's say, a storage tank in itself, um, the endurance factor becomes important because methanol, um, it is significantly, holds significantly lesser energy than the conventional MGO, MDO, or HFO. So that would mean we need to cater more volume uh, for the same level of endurance. So then the question would become, do we need to get the same endurance or are we then maybe going to have to alter the bunkering operation or the bunkering profile of the vessel? Um, and then there are questions in terms of uh, whether the fuel tanks in its, which are currently carrying, let's say, HFO, LSFO, can those be repurposed for carrying uh, methanol? Of course, then we will then have to look into the provision for coffer dams, um, surface finish requirements, um, and a number of additional systems that we that we will then have to install uh, on board that particular storage facility. Uh, in addition, there will be need to install uh, fuel bunkering uh, provision processing systems, as we saw in the earlier slide. And if you are looking at, let's say, the engine conversion, um, then uh, it would completely depend upon the specific engine uh, version model and also the engine maker. Uh, but some of the modifications could include uh, the control system upgrade, in installation of some of the um, in fuel injection systems for methanol and also pilot fuel injection systems as we need to still retain um, a a, some level of pilot fuel and also the dual fuel capability for the vessel. So the HFO system or the LSFO process system which we had initially on the vessel will be still retained. Uh, in addition, there will be some necess necessary requirements for uh, getting the NOx certification accepted for the, uh, for the engine and all those. Um, in addition, we are also looking at a number of additional safety systems, including ventilation systems, fire and gas detection systems, provision for firefighting, um, and also inerting with uh, sort of nitrogen. So conversion in terms of its considerations, uh, we need to be looking at specifically for each vessel to what extent we need to be modifying the arrangements. And are there then some examples? Yes, in the past, uh, we have had the, one of the first methanol fuel conversion project uh, with Stena Germanica. And the, the main engines were converted and we ended up complete hazard hazard workshops. And there are also provisions for uh, methanol bunkering storage and processing actually added on to the vessel. And it has been in service uh, and there are sig significant experience in terms of uh, its maintenance and other uh, um, operational aspects of this particular vessel. And we are also looking at a number of other con possible conversion projects, uh, for instance, specifically with con container ships and some of the other ship types. So. Uh, as seen in Douglas's uh, session earlier, uh, there is considerable interest also in uh, carrying out some form of conversion of uh, a, a conventionally fueled vessels. So now just to uh, summarize the discussions uh, in terms of methanol and its time uh, as a marine fuel. So if you look at the technology, uh, we can see that the application, it's techno technically feasible. So we have uh, significant knowledge and experience in the systems to keep the methanol or stored methanol on board, process it. And also in terms of the fuel consumers, both main engines and auxiliary engines, all of that is uh, in place. In addition, there are some significant amount of uh, safety systems and experience related to that. Uh, in terms of regulatory requirements or classification aspects, uh, the class respective requirements are in place and has been, and, and, and of course, lessons from ongoing projects are continuously being incorporated into this um, so that uh, the latest information could be uh, adopted for uh, any particular vessel. And in terms of in service experience, there are a number of new build projects and also vessels in service uh, with sufficient in, uh, experience um, in terms of its operation, in terms of design and arrangements. And uh, while actually by following, uh, let's say, the risk-based uh, assessment, um, we are then still really able to uh, optimize the specific designs for the vessels uh, while still complying with the prescriptive uh, requirements. So uh, that was in, uh, in summary what I wanted to share. More of these details are available within our publication. And with that, I hand over to uh, 
Craig. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sobit, uh, for that presentation. And just a reminder to everybody to put your questions um, into the panel available so that I can ask them to Sobit, to Douglas, and even to Tom Strang, who's now going to join us for a few minutes of a conversation with me, just to um, get the perspective from the uh, the ship owner's perspective. As I mentioned, uh, Tom has been within uh, Carnival since 2000, but before that he was uh, a naval architect, um, actually working at Lloyd's Register, I believe, uh, before <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. And he's got a lot of uh, experience with building up the strategy within, uh, within Carnival, um, particularly within the LNG strategy. So, so Tom, I, I mean, basically, I mean, what I want to know from you is if you look at what you've you know about methanol and thinking about what we just heard from Sobit and Douglas now about availability, production, and about the technology and the options. What do you? What for you are the key questions that you, as a sort of ship owner, a ship operator, will be looking to get answered as you look at your future strategy? Well, thanks very much, uh, first of all, for, to Lloyds for inviting me onto this, and Craig, thanks for the question. And I think we've we've heard two very good presentations around a lot of the, uh, I would say, concerns that we have as ship owners that may help to answer some of those concerns at least. But I think if I if if I look at it from where we sit in Carnival and we're looking at this, you know, we've obviously put a big investment into our LNG fleet and our LNG strategy. But as we begin to look and as it happens, we do have one ship at the moment which has a, meth a small methanol tank on board, which is for use on a fuel cell, which is currently in the commissioning phase. So we are, you know, we do, we are looking at all of these alternative fuels. I think clearly the first thing you look at is whether it's for a retrofit or a new build. You know, what is the availability of the, you know, for us those medium speed engines that would be connected to our power generation systems. Um, and they'll have to be dual fuel, I think, because in the early days, at least, I don't think any of us are going to be going immediately for a pure methanol engine in the cruise sector. I think there's the questions around endurance. We heard Sobit mention around the energy density of the fuel, the space it would require. Um, and there are some safety considerations that we need to look at with, with, the, with regards to the flammability. But possibly the biggest concern is the availability and the scalability of green or e-methanol coming, coming forwards. Um, what are those timelines? What do they look like? What's the carbon intensity going to be? You know, what's the availability going to be of the different feedstocks that we need to have for these fuels in the future? And I think that's probably where our biggest questions lie at the moment. It's around, you know, that availability. We've we've seen the technology, we've been on board the Stellar Germanica, we've talked to our engine manufacturers. There are going to be some challenges in that space, clearly. I'm a naval architect, I've always been an optimist that we can we can solve most of the technical issues but at what when are, when are we going to have them solved and what's the reliability level going to be we've certainly seen challenges with fuel cells and the timelines that we we see so wh where does this leave us in that fuel choice and i think that's the biggest uncertainty and it comes around and there's cost of course i you know i should i have to mention that the cost right now if we look for green methanol or e-methanol even is very very high yeah, and, and and what about the uh, the transition? If, it, if when we're talking about where you would go, you mentioned sort of retrofitting potential new builds and um, and with the fuel. But of course, we see the different colours of the fuel, and that will yeah. come into the carbon accounting as well. Are you are you cautious about the colour of the methanol? Um, if uh, I can put uh, it that way. Absolutely, for us, we see. Well, as far as we've done, our assessments will tell us that, and you know, I don't want to disagree with one of our previous speakers, but I'm not sure we would want to start utilising great methanol. I don't think that, you know, that would be on a well to wake basis. We'd be in a worse off situation than, than we currently are. We really see the need, in particular, as we've got these new regulations entering into force in the European Union very soon, where, of course, a lot of our ships are exposed. And we saw from one of the maps, the availability looks great. But what we're looking for is green methanol or in the future, exactly. e-methanol. So, you know, that's what we would be. That's what we would be looking for. Did, and so that conversation that you're having, um, because you... As a, as a cruise operator, you've got certain ports that you will call into on a regular basis, or you'll have um, schedules that you'll plan two or three years in advance, won't you? So that your passengers know where they're going and you'll 
be able to give them the holiday, the vacation that, that they yeah. want. So are you beginning to have conversations with specific ports and ports or terminals about this, about how they can help you as a, as a ship owner and operator with this transition? I, I, absolutely. You know, as you, as you mentioned in your introduction, I led our LNG strategy and we had to do something similar there. We would follow, we're following effectively in the same footprint. It, it, we were having those discussions to try and understand what's the availability of that fuel going to be. We do hear, you know, I don't want this to sound negative, but we do hear an awful lot around, you know, there's fuel availability in 100 ports, et cetera, et cetera. But when you actually then begin to look into it in detail, there are no bunker vessels available. There's no bunkering infrastructure. Um, there's no methodology yet that's been developed for this. The rules and regulations are being developed um, at pace. We understand that. But when you actually look at that supply chain in those locations, and one of the other things I think we have to remember for the cruise sector is that we don't always go to the same ports that the, that the container lines and the bulk and tanker operators will be going into. So there's quite a lot of ports that we go to which are smaller and may not want to look at that multi-fuel infrastructure in the future. So those are the, you're exactly right, Craig, those are the discussions we're having to have. Yeah. You know, we're talking to suppliers. What do they see their growth potential in those regions is going to be? What's the scalability and availability of the right molecule on, of the right color, to put to your point, in that location? And those, are, those really are the critical discussions that are ongoing at the moment. Great. And, and just a final question before we go back and open up the panel so I can ask questions uh, to Sobit and to Douglas. You, you mentioned that you've got um, one vessel that's it's got a methanol tank and you're using a fuel cell on there. Can you elaborate a little bit more about where you see methanol initially kind of fitting in? Are, are you looking at it being like, a, like with a fuel cell? Perhaps I would imagine that being for hotel load on a vessel um, generating the electricity. That you yeah. need rather than propulsion how do you see this transition if you, if you were to do, look at a methanol transition well i, I think actually at the moment we, you know that, that so we are part of a, a paxel project that was uh, funded by the german government with I, for one of our ada fleet which is as we said in the commissioning phase at the moment and that is exactly right that was looking at a test demonstration to understand how you might scale up to be able to utilize a fuel cell for hotel loads in the future there's a number of other you know, other ship cruise operators in the space who are looking at fuel cells. I think we've seen the technology development uh, slow in that area, and it's not um, matured to Doug's point as fast as we had expected it would. So there are some challenges there. I think it's more, you know, and we've also got a number of uh, cruise ships that are potentially going to be a new builds with um, coming through for methanol. Yeah. For Disney, have mentioned some. We've seen Tui and others have mentioned those. So, so there is there is already some development taking place in that in the space. I think where we see, you know, perhaps one pathway might be to do a, some kind of conversion. You know, I'm not, you know, we're, we're we're having those discussions to understand what that might mean. You know, to look and see how that would help us understand, you know, the use, the availability, the technology pathways. We haven't, you know, I think like many, we're still, you know, I won't say struggling, but we're still looking at all of the different options that, that are out there. You know, it, what is the best molecule going to be in, in the future a transition? And certainly looking at those projections that we saw from the graphs from um, yeah. Doug as well, I think we can certainly see methanol will play, have a, have a significant role to play. Whether that's going to be the one that we decide upon or not is uh, yet to be decided. But clearly, we've, we're already starting and we're looking into this space, and we're doing a lot of work, a lot of work there. I know that's not specifically answered your question, but we are, like I said, you know, it, it's it's one of those uh, it's one of those challenges today, which is you know making this life so interesting and making the whole you know decarbonisation pathway as uh, uh, as challenging as it is, you know, is is methanol the, is the next fuel? Is it biomethane? You know, is it ammonia? Which one of those fuel choices do you know? We have lots of options out there, and we're just investigating as much as we can to understand, you know, what that looks like. Because at the end of the day, we've got to be clear. We've got goals and aspirations to out to 2050 as a company. Many others have. We need to see that carbon reduction. And at the moment, I think we're we're seeing an awful lot around. Uh, you know, what's that intensity actually going to be? You know, how are we going to see the reductions that, that, that are being claimed? 
great. Tom, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Um, I see that uh, your phone just rang. <laughs> Sorry, it's just... <laughs> But maybe I could invite, um, if we could bring back now uh, Douglas and Sobid so we can ask questions. We've got about 20 minutes, but we do have a lot of questions already coming in. I, I looked last time and we got um, about 800 people on this uh, webinar, and it seems like a lot of them have started to ask questions. But uh, Douglas, I'm going to start by asking a couple of questions that have come in for you, if I may, because they, they relate to, you and it they kind of echo some of Tom's comments just then relating to ensuring that there is enough methanol supply and there is enough met green methanol. Can you elaborate maybe then on how we can ensure as a shipping industry, all of the maritime sectors, all of the sectors, whether it's the cruise sector or the container sector, can it get access to the methanol and how we get access to the right kind of methanol, if you know what I mean, the green or the blue methanol for our accounting, carbon accounting purposes. And a, and a final question tucked into that, I think, is how we ensure that the vessels are going to get the right coloured methanol that they are expecting, the sort of pedigree of the supply chain. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Craig. And, and I, I'm really happy that Tom actually challenged my assessment perhaps a little bit earlier during the presentation. I think from, in my mind, uh, methanol is not necessarily a silver bullet, right? Is there enough green methanol to go around to to immediately get to the end state of minimum carbon uh, footprint and a maximum, uh, you know, contribution from shipping to the sustainability goals? So that, that's one thing, but. How I kind of envisage or see it is you have to start somewhere and for most shipping companies, perhaps the application of methanol is almost like dipping your toe in the water, right? It's a fuel that's relatively benign, fairly well understood and relatively easy to apply. So a transition pathway could be something like this. I'll use gray. Me, uh, methanol up to let's say the late 2020s then as blue and green starts emerging in at scale or at an improved scale i move from my gray supply to my blue and my green supply over time and we know that technology electrification of methanol for example we know that predictions if you look further down the horizon to the late 2030s the prices of electrofuels will come down. So for me, it's not about we need green now, although that's fantastic if we could get it. But the reality of it is there will not be enough green uh, methanol at scale for the entire industry. Yeah, maybe for the big uh, the big operators who can have private contracts, uh, uh, you know, etched out with with major producers perhaps, but not for everybody. And I think therefore this kind of go from gray to blue to green is a nice transition story that can be uh, feasibly undertaken. Uh, to your next question about how do we secure that we actually get the right color of fuel? So for example, if I'm in the, in the opportune uh, state of actually being able to secure green methanol, I would not want my green methanol to be swapped out for a lesser methanol, for example, let's say grey methanol, because ultimately grey methanol and blue methanol look exactly the same. Once it's over the rail, I will not know whether or not my premium I paid to go green actually is delivering the environmental benefits. So some level of sophisticated bunker tracing around the supply chain and, and, and an assurance program around supply chains is absolutely necessary if we want to ensure that the supply chain is transparent, uh, has high levels of integrity. And I think, never mind the actual, the, the transparency and high levels of integrity, it would be a real shame if we don't actually deliver our aspiration to reduce carbon intensity from shipping by using the right fuel. So if I buy green fuel, I should be supplied green fuel and I should be burning green fuel. And how do you do it? Through a robust supply chain management um, um, a process 
including but not limiting to bunker tracing or DNA tracing. So that's uh, all I have to say about that, Craig, at this stage. Thanks a lot. Though. Um, so bits, we've got a, quite a few technical questions coming in, which I'm going to start throwing your way. Um, some of them are more clarifications on the presentation as much as anything else. But uh, let's start with the, um, the issue of are we seeing more on the two stroke or the four stroke um, new building and retrofits and how they compare? And there's a question relating to whether we see pure methanol engines emerging or whether they will all be dual fuel engines. Perhaps we could start with those two questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks very much for the questions. So, um, of course, if you look at, let's say, the new building projects, um, the idea there is, of course, to get uh, both main and auxiliary engines um, suitable for a methanol operation. Uh, but, of course, in terms of the specifics, uh, when we go down to each ship type, then there is um, then further consideration whether the main engines and also the auxiliary engines suitable uh, for this particular specific ship type and size, are they then available? And what sort of timelines are you looking at in terms of their deliveries? So with that, um, of course, if you look into container ships and maybe smaller uh, max of the bulkers, of the max size, yes, there are main engines actually available uh, for, for their use. Um, and then in terms of auxiliary engines for larger container ships, yes, they are, they are also actually available. But then there are considerations in terms of some of the other ship types, uh, larger vessels, let's say for instance, VLCCs and all those, we're still seeing the engines being developed and perhaps the auxiliary engines again for these sort of vessels, uh, we will still maybe have to wait for some more time. Um, so in terms of the next uh, question, uh, as of now, what we're seeing predominantly is uh, all dual fuel engines and of course with the necessity for pilot fuel injection. So that's in line with what we actually see as the development timelines with almost all the engine makers. So most of them are actually focusing on getting dual fuel engines. Of course, that is also for the right reason because it will enable uh, not to have redundancy in terms of the propulsion engine rules itself and all those. Uh, but it will again depend on different ship types and how the arrangements are on board. So, yeah, I, I hope that, that clarifies. Good. And uh, just a, a follow on question for yourself and for Tom, perhaps as well here. It's relating to the fuel cell. Um, Tom and I were talking about the fuel cell uh, being able to fuel by methanol. But is it a case that the, that the fuel cell has a reformer? So it's methanol going into the reformer and the reformer produces hydrogen to go into that. And if that's the case, maybe, uh, Serbi, you can mention something to do about the energy um, requirement and density in that. So, Tom, I saw you nodding. So I guess that would be your part of the answer. It's a, it's a reformer on board, is there? Yeah, so the fuel cell we have is a PEM and it has a reformer in front of it. And ideally, we'd be looking then to have, you know, as I said, this is a trial installation at the moment. So it's a very, it's a relatively small fuel cell. You but you take the methanol, you reform it. It's, it's green methanol. It's then reformed um, into hydrogen and um, with a with CO2 output, which we would, which because of its, you know, because of the type of methanol we're using, we would want that then to be ideally in the future captured and reutilized in a way so that you get to a net zero or below zero even. But, but let's not get into the uh, details of the accounting principles here. But certainly that's that's how we see it working at the at the present time. Uh, maybe so a bit can answer can then go into a bit more detail yeah i think uh, just to add there maybe um we have also working on like the conceptual projects uh, also perhaps considering the same sort of arrangements but uh, of course in terms of uh, the additional some of the power consumption that we need to then uh, provide for the the reformation and all those will then have to be taken into consideration and of course if a carbon capture system also is considered along with this to capture the co2 generated from the reformation process uh, then that again will add to the power consumption and also the additional space requirements uh, on board yeah Thank you. Uh, Serbit, staying with you for a few more questions here. There's a question relating to fuel quality. Obviously, uh, fuel oil is um, compared, there's an ISO standard for fuel oil. What about the uh, requirements on methanol quality? 
Yeah, so I, I'll start, but I think uh, I, Douglas, perhaps you can also chip in. Um, so in terms of the stand, quality standards for methanol, as I have detailed within the, one of the presentation slides, um, currently there is the IMPCA standard that's actually available for methanol, uh, which is being carried as a cargo. Uh, and the, there is ISO working group currently working on developing the standards for uh, methanol as a fuel, as a marine fuel, and that's actually currently in draft form. And once it's being developed, uh, once it's in out, then of course the testing can then be undertaken. But more importantly, it will be um, the different traceability in terms of the different colors of methanol and how it's being produced. And uh, that will then be the, the, the challenge. But uh, Douglas, please uh, add a few things that, from your perspective. Yeah, I'm happy to quickly chip in. Everything that Sovit mentioned is, uh, is absolutely uh, pertinent and, and, and up to date as developments. I, I think for me, putting my fuel testing hat on uh, over many, many years of experience, methanol has a purity of 99% and above. So it has to be pure. I think the biggest risk that will exist in methanol bunkering is the fact that methanol also loves water uh, basically it's hydroph hydrophilic yeah mm. so how do we ensure no water ingress throughout the entire supply chain of methanol and that i think is probably the direction of travel if ship operators want to have an understanding of the quality of methanol that was delivered the origin of that challenge will be called water in all its guises, seawater. Then next question is, what about the elements in seawater? How will that then react in terms of engine components, fuel systems, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So the the key is, how do we maintain integrity of purity of methanol? And we all know that with conventional bunkering systems, uh, fuel is mixed, transported. There is water ingress through condensation, etc how do we make sure that methanol doesn't fall into the trap of a relatively dirty supply chain that we see with Vila Sifo and to a lesser extent even with uh, marine gas oil i think that's going to be the the key interesting point to to witness over many many years as we see the reality of methanol bunkering unfold in front of our very eyes over the next few years Good, thank you, Douglas. So, a um, couple of questions now relating to safety and even crew training as well. Um, there's a number of questions about uh, fuel tank uh, coatings, about venting, um, potential for methanol, and then crew training and awareness. Could you comment a little bit about, about, about those two elements of the technologies and the systems for safety and crew education and training? Yeah, definitely. Um, and yes, these are quite uh, broad uh, in terms of the, the, the corrosion aspects or in terms of the storage aspects for methanol. Um, of course, the air carrying conditions for methanol uh, in specific tanks uh, with specific coating, with specific surface finish requirements, all of that uh, are in place and we actually know we have considerable experience from uh, chemical tanker operations. So more or less in terms of the storage, uh, provision for storage and also by using let's say piping that's actually perhaps uh, stainless steel, um, that is to a certain extent the corrosion aspects can be dealt with uh, specifically from the storage and processing aspects. But then there are still aspects to consider in terms of the various components that we add into the fuel process system and also within the engine. So there is there is that risk uh, still there and of course different engine makers um, and also equipment vendors are working on it uh, by selecting the appropriate materials for those um, to ensure that these yeah, if that at all happens are minimized. Uh, of course we have seen a number of incidents uh, also for some of the existing vessels using methanol with the uh, considerations from the corrosion aspects and that's that remains um, known and uh, once it's known of course the corrective and preventive actions are being taken. Um, second maybe to ask, add uh, in terms of the uh, crew training uh, of course for the specific crew for using uh, for 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 methanol fueled ships uh, there are basic 
training requirements actually also provided from the um, IGF code. Of course, we uh, stated within the um, uh, MSC circular, the interim guidelines, uh, which actually refers back to the IGF code training requirements for an engine itself. So, of course, the basic training, advanced tankers test training requirements, uh, both certifications or advanced and basic tanker certification. And then there's some requirements for attending uh, methanol bunkering uh, simulation or real cases. These are all in place. Of course, uh, in Singapore, there is also Singapore Polytechnic, which is uh, working in terms of uh, providing this kind of training for seafarers. Of course, these are still at early stage. And uh, of course, a lot of the operators who are using methanol fueled ships uh, in the initial few are also methanol carriers. Of course, these are tanker men very familiar with the carriage of methanol. And of course, then it was just to add in the provision of uh, the equipment plus the engine uh, part of the training. Uh, it remains complex, but uh, I think there are ways forward. Tom, perhaps you could comment also on uh, the training aspects. Yeah, thanks, Craig. I think I think very often we have these discussions about future fuels and we forget about the human element and the how important that is going to be. I think um, we we had the experience of starting from LNG and we couldn't go out into the industry and steal uh, LNG engineers from the gas carrier market. So clearly there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, as there was growth taking place in that state. So we've had to train our own people, you know, and we've, we will see the same thing happening um, in the future. With methanol, we've already begun to look at what that training requirements are. Certainly we've done some training with the potential suppliers of the fuels that for for the fuel cell in the in the small quantities we will be bunkering there, and I take on board we, we take on board very clearly Doug's comments about you know the custody uh, transfer and how we ensure that that is um, you know the quality of the methanol is there. But the crew training is going to be essential. You know there are some safety concerns that we have to make sure that people are aware of the colourless flame that you have. It is toxic if it's ingested. There's you know so there's a number of elements there. But I think that this is an, another example where the upskilling and the training is going to be absolutely critical for the industry to get to get to grips with. You know, we're lucky in Carnival. We have our own training establishment in uh, CSMART in, in the Netherlands. And we are already you know, beginning to develop our own training courses there. We're working with the different regulators and class societies and, uh, the, and those who are providing, you know, at the moment, the uh, standard training packages. But then we, what we will need to do is to make them ship specific in some cases, because we are, it is, you know, to go from a tanker operation to a, an operation in an engine room, in an enclosed space, on a cruise ship is a, is a very different animal. And of course, it's not just those people who have the direct contact who need to understand. It's the firefighting teams, all of those different parts of the organization need to understand how you handle methanol in an emergency and what those safety requirements are. So, yes. Uh, it, it, it is, there's going to be a big uplift, but um, it's nothing we haven't done in the past, and I'm absolutely convinced that we can, uh, you know, we can overcome those challenges. Good. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm afraid we are actually running out of time now. Um, in the last 30 seconds, may I thank Tom and Sobit and Douglas for your input um, today into this uh, into this webinar. And just a reminder, this webinar is part of a series that uh, Lloyd's Register is producing, uh, Fuel for Thought. You'll be sent a survey. If you registered for this event, you'll be sent a survey. And Julie, you'll be sent a link to the to download the Fuel for Thought report. When they're not in so far as the presentations. I did see a number of comments about whether the presentations are going to be available. I think you'll find that all of the presentation material will be in the Fuel for Thought report. So you'll find everything you need in that. Plus, of course, you'll be down, able to download this recording. So on behalf of Lloyd's Register, my name's Craig Eason. I've been your moderator and host. It's been a pleasure. And thank you very much. And please enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.